Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello, I am Dr. Shubha, Professor of Anatomy, Kempegoda Institute of Medical Sciences, Bangalore. Today, I am going to talk about the anatomy of cecum and appendix. Once a boy visited a doctor with complaints of low grade temperature and pain in the right lower part of his abdomen. He told the doctor initially the pain was near the umbilicus but now it is lower down. So the doctor told him, let me have a look at you. And he checked. During the test, doctor tried to extend the leg of the patient. And the patient had severe pain. And the doctor told him, most probably you are suffering from appendicitis. The boy asked the doctor, doctor, but appendix is a part of the gastrointestinal system. That's what I have read in biology. How come movement of my lower leg can result in pain in the appendix. Let's see how appendix is related to a structure which moves the lower limb. Thereby, when this appendix is inflamed, can cause pain during the movement of the lower limb. So, let's look at the anatomy of cecum and appendix. The initial part of the lecture is regarding cecum and later it will be followed by appendix. Coming to the outline of this lecture regarding cecum, we have the following headings which we will be covering. It will be under introduction, types, large intestine features, topography of the cecum, relations, the interior of the cecum, blood supply, lymphatic drainage, nerve supply, applied anatomy and we will be ending with the summary. Coming to the introduction of cecum. Cecum, the word means in case of Latin as a blind sack. It's the bottom of a sack or a pouch. So it's a blind ending pouch, which is the initial part of the large intestine. It is situated in the right iliac fossa normally, but due to mal rotation of the gut, it can be situated anywhere in the abdomen from the left iliac fossa to the umbilical region or the subhepatic region or right lumbar region. You find the cecum to be unique. Now, what do you find unique in it is its size. In the body, you find certain structures which have a shorter length when compared to their breadth. Cecum is one of them. The other structures which have a shorter length are the pons, prostate, and the pituitary gland. You can remember with the help of the mnemonic 3PC, where P, three of them will be standing for pons, prostate and the pituitary gland. And the last C is for cecum. The length of cecum is 6 centimeters, whereas the breadth is 7.5 centimeters. It's the widest part of the large intestine. The shape of cecum is asymmetrical you find the cecum has a pouch which is called a saccule on the right side which is bigger on the left side it is smaller. This is on either side of the attachment of the tinea coli. Now let us look at the types of cecum. You find fetal cecum in 2% of the population where the cecum is in the form of a cone where there is the appendix attached to the tip of the cone. The next common type is infantile cecum, which is found in 3% of the population, where you find a quadrate cecum with a depression at the bottom and the appendix attached to this depression. The most common type is the adult or the normal type of cecum, where the right saccule is larger when compared to the left saccule and you find appendix is about 2 centimeters below the ileum. The next type is exaggerated type where the right saccule is of maximum 
size, left saccule is completely obliterated and the appendix is just below the ilium. This is found in 4 to 5 percent of the population. Coming to the features of large intestine corresponding to the cecum, the surface of the large intestine shows longitudinal bands. These bands are called as tenia coli. These tenia coli are of three in number. You find them to be tenia libera, tenia mesocolica and tenia omentalis. In case of cecum, you find the tenia is a little thinner longitudinal band when compared to the rest of the large intestine. You also find features on the large intestine due to this tenia that is you find the pouchings of the wall of the large intestine which will be called as hostrations and saculations formed by the tenia which is a constricted band. These hostrations and saculations are not found in case of cecum. Very rarely found is another feature of large intestine in the cecum wall and that is appendices epiploicae. It is a pouch of visceral peritoneum filled with fat. Next, let us look at the surface marking of cecum or its topography. Cecum is marked in a triangular area which is bounded by the right lateral plane or the mid clavicular line on the right side and the trans tubercular plane which is at the level of L5 against the tubercles of the ilium. Lower part of this triangular area is by the groin of the right side. Now this triangular area is where the cecum will lie. Coming to the relations of the cecum, you find cecum is covered by peritoneum on all sides and it is got two folds which are connecting it to the ilium. The upper fold is called as a vascular fold. It forms the anterior boundary for a recess which is present behind it. This is called as superior ileocecal recess. The lower fold is the non-vascular fold of Treves which bounds anteriorly you find forming the boundary for inferior ileocecal recess. These two recesses are at the junction of cecum and the ilium. So cecum is completely covered by peritoneum, occasionally it has a mesocolon suspending it then it becomes a mobile cecum. Because of its complete covering by peritoneum, you find a small recess behind the cecum itself that will be the retrocecal recess. When we look at the general relations of the cecum, you find anteriorly it is related to the anterior abdominal wall and occasionally you will find coils of small intestine when the cecum is empty. Posteriorly cecum is related to two muscles the psoas major and the iliacus and two nerves that is the genitofemoral nerve and the lateral femoral nerve of thigh. Occasionally the femoral nerve also projects in between the two muscles forming a posterior relation to the cecum. It is also related to two vessels the right gonadal vessels and the right external iliac vessels. So these form the posterior relations of the cecum. So most important please note the iliopsoas muscle which brings about flexion of the uh, hip. You find this muscle gets stretched when you extend the thigh. So if there is irritation in the cecal area this muscle can get inflamed. Superiorly cecum becomes continuous with the ascending colon at the ileocecal orifice or the junction with the ilium. Inferiorly it is a blind ending pouch and it is related to the lateral half of the inguinal ligament which connects the anterior superior iliac spine to the pubic tubercle. Medially you find it becomes continuous with the ilium at the ileocecal orifice and Below the ileocecal orifice is the appendix attached to the cecum. Now let us look at the 
features in the interior of the cecum. When you open up the cecum, this is how it looks. In the posterior medial wall, you find two openings. One is the orifice of the ilium, which is called as iliocecal orifice, and the other one is the orifice of the appendix, which is called as appendicular orifice. You can see the appendix projecting down below here and its orifices here. Whereas ilium is found here, and this is the orifice of the ilium opening into the cecum. This is called as iliocecal orifice. This iliocecal orifice is guarded by a valve which is called as iliocecal valve. This iliocecal valve is situated on the posterior medial wall of cecum. It has got two lips and these two lips are formed by reduplication of the small intestine wall. So, you find it is formed by reduplication of the mucosa, the submucosa and the muscularis externa where the sphincter is formed by the muscularis externa in which the circular muscle fibers are thick and the longitudinal muscle fibers form only a partial reduplication. The rest of the superficial longitudinal muscle fibers will pass uninterruptedly. So, you find this reduplication of the intestinal wall forming the ileocecal valve. This ileocecal valve has got two lips. You can see an upper lip here and a lower lip. The upper lip is horizontal whereas the lower lip is a concave superiorly. The two ends of the lips meet and you find the anterior or the left end is rounded, the posterior end is narrower and these two ends will continue as two folds of membrane forming what is called as frenula. These up, uh, valves uh, lips will have two surfaces, one is towards the ileum that is on the inner aspect of the orifice and the other one is towards the cecum. The surface on the towards the ileum will show features of small intestine. So, they will have on the surface they will have the villi whereas the cecal surface will have the features of the cecum there you find the orifices of the openings of the intestinal glands. This is seen in the colon mucosa. Next, when we look at the sphincter, it is formed by the thickening mainly of the muscularis externa and that too the circular smooth muscle fibers with very few longitudinal smooth muscle fiber getting thickened. This sphincter, which may not be demonstrated physiologically, is controlled by the passively by the distension of the cecum which closes the sphincter and also actively by the sympathetic nervous system. The function of the ileocecal orifice and the valve is to prevent reflux of cecal contents into the ileum. So, this contents which are present in the cecum should not be pushed into the ileum. So, these valves will guard the orifice preventing reflux, they are unidirectional. So, they open only towards the cecum. They also delay in the passage of contents from the ileum to the cecum. That is about the function of the ileocecal valve. Next coming on to the appendicular orifice, this is the appendicular orifice which is about 2 centimeters below the ileocecal orifice in the posterior medial wall of the cecum. This appendicular orifice is guarded by a semilunar fold of mucous membrane which is called of valve of Gerlach. It is just a fold of mucous membrane without much function. Next, going on to the arterial supply of cecum, when we look at the arter arteries supplying the cecum, we see that there are branches coming from the superior mesenteric artery, which is the artery of the midgut. Since cecum develops from the post arterial segment of the midgut, you find branches of superior mesenteric artery supplying the cecum. This branch of superior mesenteric artery is the iliocolic branch, which has a superior division and an inferior division. What is seen here is the inferior division of iliocolic artery. This gives anterior cecal branches, which will run in the superior iliocecal fold to reach the anterior surface of the cecum. It also gives 
posterior cecal branches, one of these branches from the posterior cecal will also supply the appendix. So, anterior and posterior cecal branches supplying the cecum are coming from the inferior division of iliocolic artery. Next, let us look at the venous drainage. The veins follow the arteries and they will be going to the iliocolic vein. So, anterior and posterior cecal veins will end in iliocolic vein which ends in superior mesenteric and superior mesenteric vein is a formative tributary of portal vein. So, cecum will be draining into the portal venous system. Looking on at the lymphatic drainage, the large intestine has epicolic lymph nodes which lie on the surface of the large intestine. So, similarly, there can be lymph nodes found on the cecum. These end in lymph nodes which are found on the sides of the large intestine, especially the medial side. They are called as paracolic lymph nodes. Next, we will find intermediate lymph nodes draining them. Here, it is the iliocolic lymph nodes and lastly, the preterminal lymph nodes which is the superior mesenteric lymph nodes, preterminal lymph nodes. These superior mesenteric lymph nodes will ultimately drain into para-aortic lymph nodes which will be found on either side of the aorta. That is the lymphatic drainage. Now, we will go on to the nerve supply of the cecum. Cecum is supplied by autonomic nerves. The sympathetic fibers arise from T10 and T11 and L T12 and L1. So, T10 to L1 fibers arising from the spinal segments will be supplying sympathetic supply to the cecum via the splanchnic nerves which take part in superior mesenteric plexus. This plexus also receives branches of parasympathetic fibers coming from both vagus. So, superior mesenteric plexus carrying these fibers will be supplying the cecum. Next, we will look at the applied anatomy of cecum. Cecum, you can find a mass in the right iliac fossa, then you have to rule out certain diseases like amoebiasis. Amoebiasis is an infection a parasitic infection most commonly caused by entamoeba histolytica. So, this can give rise to a mass on the right iliac fossa if it involves the cecum. Next, ileocecal tuberculosis can result in a mass in the right iliac fossa. Tuberculosis infection of the ileum and the cecum can result in this mass. There can also be carcinoma of the cecum like any other part of the colon. Cecum acts as a guide in case of intestinal obstruction. How is this, how does it act as a guide? Now, if the cecum is filled with food and there is in intestinal obstruction, then you will have to suspect the obstruction happening in the large intestine. And if the cecum is empty, if there are no contents in the cecum, then you have to suspect an obstruction in the small intestine. Therefore, there is no content in the cecum. Next, we look at the condition called as intersusception, which is common in the age group of 3 months to 3 years. This is nothing but telescoping of the ileum into the cecum. You find the ileum enters the cecum like a telescope and what happens is the iliocecal orifice will act as a constricting band to this portion of the ileum, thereby cutting off the blood supply to the distal portion of the ileum which is beyond the iliocecal orifice in the cecum, thereby causing ischemia necrosis or cell death in this region. So, it becomes an emergency condition found in the age group of 3 months to 3 years, very small children. Next, how do we look at the cecum? We can look at the cecum by doing an endoscopy and this will be done through the anal canal and this is called as colonoscopy. If the cecum is highly mobile, then it can undergo rotation. So, it has to be fixed 
to the posterior abdominal wall and this fixation of cecum to the posterior abdominal wall is called as cecopexy. Next, we will go on to the topic of appendix and this will be covered under these headings. First of all, the interaction and parts of appendix, the surface marking of appendix or the topography, various positions of appendix, its peritoneal covering or the meso appendix, its orifice called as appendicular orifice, structure of appendix, its blood supply, lymphatic drainage, nerve supply and lastly applied anatomy will end by summarizing the topic of appendix. Coming to the appendix, it is also called as vermiform appendix. Why is it so? Because it resembles round worm. It is a narrow tubular structure resembling round worm. So, it is also called as vermiform appendix and this vermiform is not with a W but it is with a V. This is vermiform appendix. Next, let us look at the size of appendix. The length of appendix varies greatly. It can be anywhere between 2 centimeters to 20 centimeters, an average length being 9 centimeters. The diameter is usually 5 millimeters in size. Next, looking at the parts of appendix, it has a base. This part is the base. The rest of it is the body and the terminal portion is the tip of the appendix. When we do a surface marking of the appendix, usually we mark the fixed part of the appendix and that is the base. And where do we mark this appendix? You find the trans tubercular plane passing across the tubercles of the iliac crest at the level of L5. And the junction between this and another line drawn that is the right lateral plane or the right mid clavicular line. And at this junction, you go down by 2 centimeters and mark a point that will be the marking for the base of the appendix. And the tip can move anywhere and it can lie in different positions. So, based on this, you have different positions for appendix. Now, here is the tinea coli which acts as a guide for the base of the appendix because once you trace the tinea of the cecum, you find that the appendix can be caught on while doing a laparoscopic surgery. So, identification of appendix is by looking at the tenure of the cecum which leads it to the appendix. So, that will be the base of the appendix. The tip can point in any direction. So, positions of the tip will decide the position of the appendix. The commonest position which is found in about 60 percent of the population is retrocecal appendix. Retrocecal appendix is behind the cecum in the retrocecal recess and this can also be expressed by using the hour hand of a clock depending on the classification by trees. So, retrocecal appendix becomes 12 o'clock position of appendix. Next, you find splenic type of appendix where it is directed towards the spleen and this will be 2 o'clock in position and this can go in front of the ileum then it will be called as pre ileal or behind the ileum then it will be called as post ileal and this is the most dangerous type of appendix because an inflamed appendix if, if it gets burst and if it is of this type it can result in generalized peritonitis. Next you find 3 o'clock position is the promontric appendix. It will be pointing towards the sacral promontory. Next is 5 o'clock position which is pelvic. This is the second commonest type of appendix. It will be pointing down towards the pelvis lying against the obturator internus. In case of females, it will be related to the right ovary and the right uterine tube. 
Next, you find the 6 o'clock position subsecal or mid inguinal pointing towards the inguinal ligament and the last one is 11 o'clock position the paracolic appendix. So, these are the types based on the position of the appendix and you find the commonest is retrocecal and second commonest is pelvic. Next, let us look at a specimen showing the pre-ileal or post-ileal position of appendix. So, this is the appendix and this is the ileum. So, this is the most dangerous type of appendix. Coming to the peritoneal relation of appendix, appendix is completely covered by peritoneum and you find this peritoneum covering this leaves the appendix as a double layered fold which is called as meso appendix and this will be continuous with the left posterior layer of the mesentery of the ileum. So, if you trace it, it is going to become continuous with the left posterior layer of the mesentery of the ileum. This meso appendix will carry the appendicular artery to the appendix. So, that is why it becomes very important during surgery of appendix. The base of the appendix is attached to the cecum and it is going to open into the wall of the cecum. So, you can from the interior of the cecum you can see the appendicular orifice which is situated in the posterior medial wall of the cecum and this is guarded by a mucosal fold which is called as valve of gerlach. Valve of gerlach is just a mucosal fold without much functions. Next, let us look at the structure of appendix which helps in uh, making the appendix susceptible for inflammation or infection to spread at a faster pace. The mucosa and submucosa, uh, muscularis externa and serosa, these are the four basic layers of the gut wall which surround the lumen. In case of appendix, lumen is very narrow and sometimes it is obliterated, sometimes it can get impacted with fecolith, thereby resulting in inflammation of the appendix. The next layer is the mucosa, adjacent to the lumen is the mucosa, this becomes the subsequent layer that is the submucosa. Both these layers will have aggregation of lymphoid follicles. So, you find large lymphoid follicles situated in the mucosa and the submucosa of the appendix. So, it is also called as abdominal tonsil. Abdominal tonsil is the other name for appendix. Next, you find the muscularis externa which is in the form of two layers, inner circular and outer longitudinal. This shows some gaps in the wall which is called as hiatus muscularis. So, when there is a gap, what happens is the mucosa and the submucosa will come very close to the serosa, thereby an infection from the luminal surface gets easily transmitted through the layers towards the peritoneum which forms the serosa. And in this serosa will be the appendicular artery which is very close to the wall of the appendix towards its tip. So, if there is inflammation of the appendix, the appendicular artery which is very close to the wall gets thrombosed and this can result in necrosis of the tip with subsequent it can undergo a uh, uh, opening into the peritoneal cavity, it can burst open into the peritoneal cavity and this results in generalized peritonitis which is a serious condition. Let us look at the arterial supply of appendix. As we have already mentioned during cecal arterial supply, we find iliocolic artery inferior division of this is going to supply the cecum and appendix area. So, we find the anterior cecal branches and posterior cecal branches given off to the cecum. Posterior cecal artery, a branch coming from the inferior division of iliocolic can give most of the times the appendicular artery. This runs behind the ileum, it runs through the meso appendix along its free margin and runs close to the appendix tip as it reaches lower down because you find the meso appendix is narrowing down there. So, it reaches the wall and in this area since appendicular artery is an end artery, 
if there is inflammation of the appendix this undergoes thrombosis resulting in necrosis and perforation of the appendix which results in generalized peritonitis as said earlier. The appendicular artery gives off a recurrent branch which runs backwards towards the cecum and this articulates with a branch coming from the posterior cecal artery. Occasionally posterior cecal artery this branch is enlarged then it is called as artery of Shesha Chalam. Next coming to the venous drainage you find the veins accompanying the artery leave the appendix through the meso appendix it ends in iliocolic vein which drains into superior mesenteric and this is a tributary of the portal venous system which we have already seen in when we are talking about cecum. Coming to the lymphatic drainage we find the lymphatics can drain directly into the paracolic lymph nodes which are found on the medial border of the ascending colon or it can pass through the appendicular lymph nodes which lie in the meso appendix and then through the paracolic, iliocolic and reaching the preterminal lymph nodes that is the superior mesenteric lymph nodes which ultimately drain into the para aortic lymph nodes. Nerve supply of appendix is an important thing. Why? Because it is supplied by sympathetic and parasympathetic nerves. The sympathetic nerves which supply the appendix come from the 9th and the 10th thoracic spinal segments. They carry the pain sensation. So, you find a referred pain coming towards the umbilical area via the 10th spinal segment and through the somatic branch which supplies the umbilical area. So, pain from the appendix can be referred to the umbilical region via the 10th thoracic spinal segment. The proximal part of the this reflex arc is formed by the sympathetic whereas the distal part of this is formed by somatic nerve supplying the umbilicus. Parasympathetic fibers are derived from the vagus. Let us look at the applied anatomy of appendix. Normally appendix appears like this with a narrow or obliterated lumen. When it is inflamed it appears swollen and it appears red in color with lot of edema. This is how it appears when it is inflamed. Inflammation of appendix is called as appendicitis. Whenever we talk about inflammation, if you add the suffix itis to a word, a suffix itis when it is added to any word that will be called as appendicitis if it is added to appendix, this indicates inflammation. So, if you want to add itis to cecum showing that it is inflamed, then it will become cecitis. So, inflammation is indicated by fixing this suffix itis to any word and that indicates inflammation of that particular structure. So, appendicitis is inflammation of the appendix and this inflamed appendix will cause severe pain and low grade temperature. Referred pain as we talked about in the nerve supply of appendix will be referred to the umbilical region because appendix is supplied by the 10th spinal segment the sympathetic supply and you find the umbilical area will receive somatic fibers from the same segment. So, pain is referred from the appendix to the umbilicus initially. Later, the pain shifts to right iliac fossa when the parietal peritoneum gets affected. When there is appendicitis, you find maximum tenderness is found at this point and this point is called as McBurney's point. McBurney's point is marked by drawing a line connecting the umbilicus to the anterior superior iliac spine and marking a point at the junction of the medial two thirds and the lateral one third will indicate this point which is called as McBurney's point. 
Here is maximum tenderness during appendicitis. Next, we see a sign which becomes positive in appendicitis. This is called as Rousing's sign. When a person's left lateral lower quadrant is palpated, the pain is experienced in the right lateral quadrant due to inflammation of the appendix in this condition. Why is this so? It's because the parietal peritoneum which is inflamed gets stretched when there is movement of the organs from the, the left quadrant towards the right quadrant. So, when you are palpating this area, the stretching of the parietal peritoneum here will cause pain in this region. This is called as Rousing's sign. Next test is called as SOAS test. In this, what we do is try to extend a person's limb at the hip joint and the knee and when you do this extension, the person will have excruciating pain in the right iliac fossa. Why is this so? Because the right iliopsoas, which is the posterior relation as we have seen earlier to the appendix, when the appendix is inflamed, they are also inflamed or get irritated. So, when there is stretching of these two muscles during the extension, it can cause pain in this area. So, you find extension of the lower limb giving rise to pain in the right iliac fossa due to stretching of the psoas major. Hence, this is called as psoas test. It is also called as Cope's psoas test. The next test which can confirm appendix being inflamed is obturator test. Obturator internus which is related to pelvic appendix, this gets if it gets inflamed results in irritation of the obturator internus. So, if the person's leg is flexed and medially rotated, person will have excruciating pain because of the stretching of the obturator internus. So, obturator test becomes positive when the appendix is found to be of the pelvic type, whereas the previous test what we saw, SOAS test becomes positive in case of the commonly found appendix position and that is if you can recall, it is the retrocecal position of appendix that is very closely related to the SOAS major. Next, we will look at the subhepatic cecum and appendix when there is small rotation of the gut or the non-descent of the cecum. So, during rotation of the gut after the uh, pre, um, arterial segment of the midgut loop enters the abdomen, initially it will be found the hepatic bud along with the cecum and the appendix will be found in the left iliac fossa. Later, it will be found in the umbilical region, then it moves to the uh, position below the liver and then it has to descend down to the right iliac fossa. If there is no descent or arrest in the descent, you find the cecum and the appendix lying uh, just below the liver and this is called as subhepatic cecum and appendix. Inflammation of the appendix in this region can mimic cholecystitis, thereby a diagnosis can be confusing in case of subhepatic cecum and appendix and the appendix being inflamed. When appendix gets inflamed, it has to be removed, otherwise because they, it can undergo perforation and result in generalized peritonitis which is a much more severe condition. So, removal of appendix is called as appendicectomy. The suffix ectomy to any word attached will indicate that it has to be removed. Surgical removal of appendix is appendicectomy. Most commonly it is done as a laparoscopic procedure and to identify the appendix, they have to follow the stenia on the cecum which will lead the surgeon towards the base of the appendix. So, inflamed condition it becomes difficult to identify. So, you have to follow the tenia, tenia coli which is present on the anterior surface of the cecum which reaches the base of the appendix because all the three tenia will be converging towards the base of the appendix. To summarize, 
this lecture, we looked at first the anatomy of the cecum, which is a blind sac situated in the right iliac fossa supplied by the iliocolic branch of superior mesenteric artery as it develops from the midgut and artery of midgut being superior mesenteric artery. It is commonly involved in a condition called as amoebiasis and you find in the age group of 3 months to 3 years it can undergo ileocecal or through the ileocecal orifice the ileum entering the cecum resulting in what is called as intersusception a condition commonly seen in 3 months to 3 years of age. Next we looked at the anatomy of appendix which is also called as vermiform appendix because of its resemblance to a round worm and the commonest position of the tip of the appendix is retrocecal or pelvic and you find that the appendicular artery supplying the appendix is an end artery thereby necrosis along with thrombosis can result resulting in perforation of the appendix. The pain from the appendicitis it will be referred to umbilical area because of the common nerve supply one being sympathetic and the other one being somatic and the maximum tenderness point in case of appendix is the McBurney's point and removal of appendix is called as appendicectomy. Thank you.